Schmidt Sperling. I'm the editor in chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at FlexLogic with Jeff Tate, who's going to talk today about the importance of software in inference accelerators. So, Jeff, when people think about FPGAs and even inferencing chips and accelerators, most of the time they think about the hardware. How do they get that as fast as possible? How much importance does software play in this? Software, it is critical. Uh, obviously, for an inference accelerator to work, uh, you need the right hardware. But the hardware alone is just a, a piece of silicon, a rock, without the right software. Typically, when you think about inferencing hardware, um, you think about the programmability in it. But most people think about that as if we, we improve the hardware to its maximum, we're going to get the maximum performance. Software is a big knob to turn here. How much improvement can you get by working with the software very closely with the hardware? Sure. Well, of course, for inference accelerators, they have to be programmable because every customer believes that their model will continue to evolve over time and they want to be able to take advantages of enhancements. So nobody wants a hardwired accelerator. But they want programmability in a way where they can get the most throughput for, for a certain cost and the most throughput for a certain amount of power. So you have to use the hardware very efficiently in order to do that. And what's critical is you have to have the software designed in parallel with the hardware to make sure that the two of them work together to achieve maximum throughput efficiency. So why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. Jeff, what are we looking at here? What we're looking at here is the key elements that every inference accelerator has to have. But everybody puts them together in a very different way. So if you're going to run inference, for example, YOLO V3, a two megapixel image, it takes around 300 billion multiply accumulated, accumulates in order to process a single two megapixel image. So you have to have a lot of max. But there's many ways in how you can group the max. Uh, systolic arrays, one dimensional systolic arrays, individual max. So there'll be many approaches. You have to have on-chip SRAM. There's a lot of intermediate activations that have to be written, stored, and recycled. And unless the chip is really big, you're gonna have to have off-chip DRAM. Any chip that's in the range that will go into uh, a, a system that's relatively economic outside of the data center, is going to be small enough that to run the kinds of models like Yellow V3, you'll have to have a DRAM. Uh, but different chips will have very different amounts of memory and how they organize the memory, whether they couple the memory closely to the compute units in a distributed fashion or have a single big block, there'll be a lot of variation there. You have to have control logic. Something has to orchestrate the flow of data through the chip and decide what to do, how long to do it, when to stop, etc. And then very importantly, and rarely talked about, is the interconnect. The interconnect is the plumbing of the chip that moves data between memory and compute and back again in an efficient way to keep the max fed. So this is the hardware, and what people mostly focus on is TOPS. TOPS is the number of max times the frequency times two. Uh, and a little bit on this, almost none on that, but the part that people almost never talk about in articles is the software. How much of the hardware over there on your fi five elements that you've listed is programmable? Uh, well, it's all programmable, uh, depending on your definition. The, the, pro the programming is really of the control logic. The control logic is the thing that takes the units and orchestrates how they work together to get things done. Uh, so arguably, this is where the programmability is primarily existing. You know, memory isn't programmable. You can write different things into it, but it doesn't take action. The Macs are typically organized in blocks where you feed data in and you get data out, but they process the blocks in predictable ways with some programmability. The interconnect in some chips is programmable like in ours. So where does the software fit in and how does that layer across this? Okay, so without software, all these things would do nothing. You need software for any programmable chip in order to run. And the input to the software, at least for our chips, and what customers have is neural network models. In our particular case, we take neural network models for Integer 8 or BFLOAT 16 um, in Onyx or TensorFlow Lite. And then our software processes them. And all of everybody's software is going to have to do at least a few steps. They're going to have to have an algorithm. 
the algorithm basically is how do I take the neural network model and then orchestrate these resources to keep them as busy as possible while completing the computation in the shortest time and the shortest power. The next is performance estimation. If I run the algorithms, how long will it take to process a frame for that model, for that numerics, for that image size? And last is actually generating the code that actually gets loaded onto the processor to run it. Where do you see the biggest inefficiencies of how people have been doing this in the past? Well, we've had customers uh, who've designed their own chips talk to us about, I remember one customer very vividly six months ago saying, we built a chip, it's got lots of Macs, lots of memory, but the software people can't get the throughput out of it. And it sounded like the software work was done after the hardware was architected and built to a large extent. We've had other customers tell us that they're surprised that we're able to give performance modeling information, even though we don't yet have silicon. Our silicon will tape out shortly. Um, because they say other vendors they've talked with are unable to give them benchmarks in advance of silicon. And we've even seen examples of companies of naming names that have silicon and it's months later before they publish their first benchmarks. This has been an argument for a long time in, in development of chips. It goes all the way back into the mid-90s when people were talking about co-design. What's changed here? Well, nothing has changed. The, the right way to do this is that you should design your software in parallel with your hardware. And it's critically important when you're designing a brand new piece of hardware. Arguably, if you're designing generation number 17 of a chip, you probably have a pretty good idea of what's important to optimize in the chip in order to get good throughput. But when you're designing a chip that of a kind that's never existed before uh, and you are running models uh, that are rapidly changing, you have to make a lot of architectural trade-offs. How do you make those trade-offs without working your software in parallel with your hardware? And those are the real fundamental changes of what's going on in the market right now, right? Because a lot of these chips never existed before, a lot of the applications never existed before, at least on a, uh, the level that we're using them today. AI is almost everywhere. And on top of that, nobody has had to worry about, if we're going into this market, we have this many changes. It's always been sort of a roadmap forward. You knew where you were going. Yes, AI is very different. Um, and although AI is uh, being uh, shipped in billions of units, billions of dollars, it's, it's chips that were never designed for AI that are being used. The new generation of chips have AI-specific architectures, and there you'll see, we've already seen, we'll see a wide range of architectures. And the right way to do it, uh, I recently read about Grok, they talked about they wrote their software before they started their hardware, and that's the approach that we've taken as well. In reality, what you're doing here is creating an iterative process where you're going back and forth between the hardware and software and tweaking both depending upon what you find in the other one. How's that working out? Uh, well, for us, it's been critical, and I think that any successful inference company in the future will find that they worked software early on as well. As an example, when we first started developing our chip architecture, it was because customers asked if we could optimize FPGA, which is used by people like Microsoft and the data center for inference, to do inference more efficiently. So we started studying models. We studied uh, like the Google TPU chip. And one of the first things that Chen, my co-founder, did was build a performance estimation model in order to determine how different amount of max, different amounts of memory, different amounts of DRAM would change relative throughput and, of course, also the die size and therefore cost of the solution. One of the initial ideas behind this is that you would create things in modules. So in, in software, there was the whole object-oriented approach. In hardware, there was the building blocks and the that people would use. Is that, does that still work? Is it still, we, here's what we're going to fix first versus here's what uh, we have to completely redo the software and we have to re completely redo the hardware? Mm, well, this may be different. Um, neural network models are modular because each layer is processed fairly independently. You take the activations that were the output of the previous layer, you run them through the current layer and generate a new set of activations and you're repeating that cycle, but every layer is doing a different operation. And each operation you can think of as a different module. It's using the resources in a different way. 
There's also a lot of types of neural networks too. Does that matter here? Yes, it does matter. Because some of the neural networks will use the hardware and software very differently than other neural networks. So let's dig into this a little bit. How exactly does the software work with the hardware? Well, early on in talking with customers, uh, what we realized is that uh, as we built the performance estimation models, we originally did ResNet 50 because that was the thing we'd read about the most. Um, and those are on relatively small images. And talking with customers, we realized that people wanted to process megapixel images. And you can process megapixel images on ResNet 50. The model we had was such that we could just type in different image sizes and we'd get different results very quickly. And then we realized that probably the highest volume application would be object detection and recognition, certainly not the only one. And we chose to use that as our like North Star for architecture, build a chip that would be very good for megapixel processing of YOLO V3. And in doing that, that allowed us to make trade-offs to build a chip that had relatively small amounts of max, relatively small amounts of SRAM, just a single DRAM, but yet this chip at 50 square millimeters has performance similar to a Tesla T4, which is like seven times larger and costs much, much more money. You know, we go back into the classic engineering, when hardware and software engineers, even in the same company, sat down at a table, a lot of times you'd see them exchanging business cards because they really had no interaction. Has that changed, and if so, what's happening? Well, the good thing about being a startup is uh, all of our people are within 50 feet of each other. So they uh, end up talking a lot whether they like it or not. Uh, I sit in the corner office, the table in the corner of the building, but I can hear the engineers on the other side, you know, talking. So being a small team is very good for interdisciplinary development. And it's been very important that our software people talk with our hardware people uh, and that the interaction goes back and forth. What's happening now is we went from performance estimation to actually building the full compiler to generating code because as we had the chip RTL done, the way to verify the chip RTL at the top level is to run entire layers of models through the chip with megapixel images. So we had to have the ability to generate all the code, all the bit streams that control the device and process them and that got the two teams working together very closely. And then the next step that's happened is that we have customers coming to us with particularly challenging models where they have hopes of performance that they're not able to see achieve from existing solutions and they're sharing their models with us and that's allowing us to further improve our algorithms to extend them to be very good for classes of models that we previously hadn't anticipated because we weren't aware of them. In the past, when hardware and software engineers got together, they didn't have the same tools to actually work on the same problem the same way. So what's gluing them together now? What's changed? The customer's models are neural networks. And they come to us in Onyx or TensorFlow Lite. Our software basically takes these neural networks and applies algorithms to uh, configure the interconnect and to write state machines that control the movement of data within the chip. And this is in RTL. The, 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 the software people are therefore generating RTL in our compiler case. The customer never sees the RTL. The customer sees this, they press a button, a file comes out, they download the file and the chip, it all works. The front end of the hardware is also written in RTL. So all of our architectures of our chip are written in Verilog and RTL, and that's turned into polygons or GDS by the physical designers. So the people who do our front end design are talking a similar language to the people who write our software. The software is written in C, but the output of the software is RTL, and actually these designers end up helping and working on the state machine implementations. So when you get engineering change orders, when you get changes in algorithms, do both teams now have to work on the changes versus in the past it was either the hardware guys or the software guys? At this point in time, we're almost taping out the chip. So the chip is 
largely frozen. We're in the final stages of, of chip tuning and tape out, uh, metal fills, various things like that. But the hardware people are looking at improvements for the next chip. So the improvements from the next chip come from studying the, the, how the software is evolving and how the models that we're seeing for customers may be shifting in a certain direction. We may make changes or we may not. Actually, we find right now that our architecture actually works pretty well with what we see. Uh, so most of the effort right now as we learn more and more goes into improving the compiler in the algorithms sense to better utilize the hardware to handle the wide range of models that are up there. Do you see this as a workable system going into the future? Is this going to be the new way of doing things? Uh, yes, I think it was the old way too. If you're Intel, you know, I know the people at Intel when we worked with them at Rambus, uh, when they, when, when things shifted from being like desktop computers to doing uh, graphics and all those things, their workloads changed and they optimized the, their processors in different ways. There are more incremental optimizations. But we'll be doing the same thing. Over the next year, you know, as we work with more and more customers, we'll build a bigger and bigger knowledge base of what matters. When we have to next make hardware decisions, we'll be able to make the decisions on the hardware based on a bigger knowledge base of what the market needs. Jeff Tate, thanks for a really interesting conversation. Thanks, Ed.